welcome to our panel today on using enterprise risk management and technology to drive change. My name is Nicole Peary. I am the president-elect of the Association for Federal Enterprise Risk Management, and I'm also the chief risk officer at the Bureau of the Fiscal Service, which is a part of the Treasury Department. So we're very excited to have a great panel with us today. Um, so I'd like to um, go ahead and if we can start our slide deck, we can look at slide number two. One more down, please. So today we have um, three panelists with us. Unfortunately, one of our panelists, Marianne Roth, um, had a, a, an emergency surgery that had to happen today, so she's not able to join us. Um, although we hope that she's gonna be okay and everything will um, work out. But um, so let me introduce our other panelists who I think you will very much um, enjoy today. So our first is Larry Koskinen. Larry is the Chief Risk Officer at the US Department of Housing and Urban Development where he leads HUD's Departmental Enterprise and Fraud Risk Management Programs. Larry has 30 years of experience um, across a variety of areas inc including data analytics, finance, human capital, information technology, strategic planning, and support operations. Our next panelist is Mike Peckham. So Mike is the reInvent Grants Management Lead for the department-wide Reimagine HHS Initiative and is the acting CFO of the department's Program Support Center. He also brings over 30 years of experience in federal accounting, program management, systems implementation, and grants. Finally, we have Dr. Nancy Potok, um, Nancy was the chief statistician of the United States until January of this year, and she's also um, previously served as the deputy director and chief operating officer of the U.S. Census Bureau, as well as other positions within the Department of Commerce. Nancy has uh, also a long and um, great history in data analytics and was one of the key drivers for the Evidence-Based Policymaking Act. So I hope you'll agree that this is, uh, should be a very interesting panel today. Um, so what we're going to do is have each panel member talk a little bit about their areas and go through their presentation. And then the second half of our panel today, we'll have some discussion and questions. Um, just as a reminder, please send us any questions that you have through the chat window, and we will um, do as many of those as we can today. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Larry. Thank you very much, Nicole. It's a privilege to be here today. Um, I have enjoyed meeting our fellow panelists, so we've had some very interesting conversations in the background. And it's uh, it falls to me today to sort of be the warm-up band for what's going to be, I think, a great uh, concert. Um, we uh, uh, are going to try to tie enterprise risk management in, a, in meaningful and actionable ways to the, the life and work of uh, performance analysts and performance professionals in the federal space. And so what I'd like to do is start out today with a look at how we um, do risk management at HUD. And uh, I, I, we should be looking at the first slide now. Good. Okay. <clears throat> so this is a concept of operations that shows how the risk management programs feed into and tie to all the different strategic planning, performance management, uh, budgeting, and assurance activities at the department. We keep track at HUD of program risks, uh, risks that are really administrative management uh, oriented, the C-suite risks, and then uh, fraud risks as well. And those uh, risks are accumulated every year in an integrated risk profile. So once a year, we refresh the top level risks. We have 15 different risk programs at HUD. Um, and those risks are um, escalated to, to the department, from to my office. Uh, if they are either so big that they cannot be mitigated within the current resource constraints of the reporting office, or uh, if they have sufficient cross-cutting importance or root cause importance that, uh, that the reporting office uh, deems them to be a department level uh, risk, and often their judgment is very good on that. So that risk profile then is uh, put together, OMB mandates in uh, A123 circular uh, that, uh, that this profile is attested to the first week of June, uh, we've continued to move the risk profile process earlier and earlier in the, in the fiscal year uh, so that we could do a more effective job of tying it uh, to the, our different budget and planning cycles. And uh, so this year, we're actually kicking it off next week. Um, that will uh, yield us a risk profile by the uh, end of December. 
Uh, and then that profile and the prioritization conclusions that my team uh, reaches and documents uh, goes to our risk management council. The risk management council is made up of the deputy assistant secretary level um, uh, executives at the, at the organization. And those declared risks and the mitigation responses and budget uh, proposals and so forth then are packaged up and sent off to the strategic planning office where they are aligned with our strategic priorities uh, incorporated as declared risks, also aligned with presidential uh, initiatives and any other top level secretarial uh, initiatives as well. Um, for you in the performance business, the, uh, the performance management plan then will track progress at the institutional and at the individual performance level. These are uh, largely mitigation efforts. Um, budget planning requests, we've met a lot of progress this year in incorporating our risks into the budget planning process. We think that's really uh, pretty important. I think anyone who works in government understands that we really do manage through the budget uh, so that if your risks are not tied in a consequential way to the budget process, uh, then you're probably doing enterprise list management, not enterprise risk management. And then I think uh, very important uh, to differentiate capital planning from uh, budget, operating budget uh, planning. Capital planning really, especially in IT, uh, investment right now has a lot to do with how government is transforming from the old style, very hierarchical um, government that we grew up with into a much more hierarchical um, results oriented citizen facing governing process of more of a verb form than the noun form. Um, and so the risk work that we do in collaboration with our, our strategic and budget colleagues really is reflected in how capital investments are being made in IT support for this new kind of organization. And then lastly, um, A123 really grew out of the assurance process or the compliance process. And we still have a foot in that, although I would have to say probably 90% of my work has nothing to do with assurance really at all. I would say if you're, if you're working with a chief risk officer, you should listen carefully to the way they describe their program as a performance management practitioner, uh, that in fact, assurance um, creeps into the risk conversations often, and it is, is, uh, is very difficult often to differentiate enterprise level operational risk from these assurance risks that we traditionally think about A123. Much of the world is still stuck in this compliance thinking. Uh, the inspector general community particularly, although they're starting to come along, uh, and I would draw your attention to their most recent document out of the SIGI group, um, which is an audit um, reference document that shows how enterprise risk management programs uh, need to be audited. So some very good insights about what the inspector general is thinking about. At any rate, what we're, what we're trying to do is show the way forward to incorporating these tough conversations of consequence into leadership decision making uh, taking a suboptimal kind of decision making that so often characterizes federal budgeting and really popping it up to the strategic and performance level in ways that really matter uh, for the improvement and the evolution of the way we do work in government. So if we look at the next slide, please. Now, <clears throat> it's not enough that we have work product that flows into these um, work streams that I've described in the last slide. What we've spent a lot of time doing at HUD is aligning these efforts in a strategic alignment calendar uh, and then spending time documenting the life cycle of the different workflows that we are working with. Um, but integration has to align with work process sequencing. And what we've learned with um, our risk management program at HUD is that by uh, getting, getting to the risks earlier, um, it makes our work more consequential and useful um, for our colleagues that are working in strategy, performance, uh, and budgeting. But these processes need to be auditable. They need to uh, tie back to assurance uh, as well. Um, and they need to be fully integrated into the, the fraud risk environment. We've, we've always treated fraud risk at HUD and uh, enterprise risk as two sides of the same coin. Um, every fraud uh, event is uh, an example of an internal control risk and every internal control weakness is an invitation to fraud and they really are highly complementary. Um, at HUD, the last point I'd like to make, and it ties back to this slide as well, is we are deeply in, involved now in a cloud-based uh, GRC uh, tool. Um, being able to track governance, risk, and compliance in one integrated environment, we think is going to be a very powerful way 
uh, to begin to think of itself not as a series of stovepipes uh, that are loosely aligned, but really rather look at a housing portfolio in all of the different ways that we work to serve under, uh, underserved families uh, in the uh, federal housing space. So next slide, please. Now this is a, a, a transition slide for the very interesting conversation coming on after me with Mike Peckham and the work that he's been doing at HHS. Um, HHS and HUD have a, a aligned missions in many ways. Uh, we are uh, using HHS services to do some of our important grant making work. Um, and we soon discovered that we were uh, trying really hard to understand uh, the risk issues related to our different portfolio. So uh, we've run a proof of concept over the last year with our Office of Community Planning and Development, where we use compute, computational linguistics modeling to analyze the A133 single audit database uh, and really look for qualitative risk in a quantitative way. In so doing, we've demonstrated that it's possible to, sell, to save a considerable amount of money um, in targeting um, analysis um, for oversight. So, it's saving us money, it's reducing time to insight, it's improving our assurance processes. And this is going on in an area where traditionally, typically, uh, we really have little or no um, line of sight. Most of the grant money that we put out, we put tens of billions out there every year at HUD, um, is in the form of block grants. And so we really, unless we put boots on the ground to do uh, an analysis, we have very little real insight into how our resources are being expended. This model allows us to sort of pull back the curtain and take a look uh, at what's going on and using sentiment analysis and then a public, publicly available quantitative analysis uh, and other publicly available uh, data, uh, we've been able to really shift into an evidence-based decision-making mode, uh, much more objective. Uh, we've reduced bias in our decision-making. It allows us to be much more proactive in the work mitigate, mitigations um, that we're putting in place. Um, it shows cross-cutting control issues that are otherwise hidden, um, which is, I think, very, very important. And most importantly, it allows our program managers to see their work as a portfolio. So there's a, 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 a little working group right now. Mike and I are, are sort of the co-invitors of, of this group. Uh, we sit around and we talk about the intersection of analytics, artificial intelligence, and blockchain. Uh, which have together, we believe, the power to make compliance uh, auditing as we as we have grown up with it, uh, really irrelevant and much more dynamic, much more forward leaning, much more citizen centric um, and much more real time, much more objective. Um, so with that, I'd like to wrap my comments up and uh, I'm eager to hear uh, what the rest of the panelists have today. So thank you. Okay. Um, so, hi, um, if we can advance to the next slide, please. Um, as Nicole said earlier, my name is Mike Peckham and I am at HHS. I'm running the reInvent Grants Management Project. Um, it's under Reimagine HHS and we are literally trying to figure out how can we do things more efficiently, more streamlined. Um, so risk always comes into mind when I think operations because you have to accommodate for realized risk, propensity for risk, and there's a, there's a happy medium in between those things. Uh, at one point in time, somebody asked me, what is enterprise risk management? And so I, I had to think for a second. I said, well, if you go back to 1975, we implemented a national speed limit of 55 miles an hour. So based on the empirical data that was available at that point in time, that was considered safe. That's what everybody was comfortable with. That's what the data was telling them at that point in time. I think we've all seen since then, we've lifted some of those speed limits. It, you know, you go out to Montana and you got posted speed limits of 80 miles an hour because you can see for five miles around you in every direction. And you can see if an animal's coming, if a car is coming, if it's persons out there. Risk levels go way, way, way down in those types of situations. In the grants portfolio within HHS, I can only speak for HHS, I would say we're still about 1973 right now from the perspective of how are we looking across our risk profile. Um, we're still doing manual comparisons and we're, we're not really that robust in being able to do you know, instantaneous analytics and comparisons. So what we did um, is we introduced uh, the idea within HHS of 
when we're talking about grants management, it's huge for us. $517 billion. Um, that was an FY19. I'll have some 20 numbers really soon, and they'll go way up because of COVID. Um, we introduced this concept, and, and I have some of the initiatives across the bottom because risk really hit on all the initiatives that you see there, the single sign-on, the, the standard form uh, 425, it's the capturing of expenditure data, um, critical path mapping, understanding how similar you do processes versus where are the deviation points. Grants management and training, um, it's all over the board across uh, you know, grants in HHS, uh, I can say that for sure. We don't have any endorsed and transferable skills that we recognize. Um, and then the notice of funding opportunity, a quality assurance tool, um, literally if you, garbage in, garbage out is the old saying, and if we don't upfront have some standards and some um, uh, basically compliance factors that we're looking for, how do we build onto a NOFO instead of how do we answer open-ended questions and repackage that information into an application, then repackage that information into a notice of award, it gets very convoluted very quickly. So we got a ton to tackle, that long and short of it. Brings me to the last item that we have there, the grant recipient digital dossier. So what we have done is we've started to look at risk and we looked at it from the perspective of talking to users. We talked to the users on the grants management side of the house and we also talked to the grant recipients. And within 2 CFR 200, there is guidance that says thou shall do a pre-award risk assessment for all new awards and competing continuations. But there's no standards there. It's, it's, it's a compliance, uh, it, it's open-ended, and we in HHS, we're doing them very, very differently across the board. We have risk questionnaires that range from 24 questions to 96 questions. So grant recipients are saying, well, why is there a range? What is this telling you? What's the 96 questions telling you that's different from the 24? I ultimately had the same question myself. So we rolled through this and we started to realize that there were some standard things that everybody was looking at across the board within grants management. Um, when you started to evaluate risk. And we did that again by talking to folks and seeing what are the systems that you're ask, accessing, what is the information that you're pulling out and how are you utilizing that information once you have that information. So if we could go on to the next slide, please. Um, so this is interesting that when we took that approach and we were originally thinking about, if you know about the president's management agenda, you know that there are cross agency priority goals and cap goal eight is aligned with grants very closely. And we were only looking at cap goal eight. How can we get results oriented accountability for grants? How can we apply risk, standard risk metrics across the board? As we started to go, go into this and we started to talk to the users and understand what they were doing, we quickly realized we hit on cap goals one through six. Um, I think that's significant from the perspective of if we're doing anything above cap goal six, you're really starting to, the first six cap goals are, are inherent to what you need to be doing. You need to be thinking about those items as you're moving forward. And the reason that I say that is the grant recipient digital dossier is an application of emerging technology. And to do this by talking to the users, and I'm gonna say this over and over again, because if you're not talking to your, your users, you're gonna build a system, it's gonna be nice, but you're gonna have a lot of issue with implementation, change management, and all the traditional issues that you have. Speaking to the users, we learned how we could go about this, aggregate information using emerging technology, applying the right emerging technology to the challenge that we were facing. Larry talked about getting information from the Federal Audit Clearinghouse, and that is very challenging. If you do that as an individual and you go in, it's approximately 14 to 15 clicks. If you really know what you're doing and you know exactly what you're looking for, you can find it in 30 seconds to a minute. And that's if you know what you're looking for. So what we did was we said, okay, we could probably make this a little bit easier for the user. So we applied robotics processing automation to extract information. We pro uh, apply natural language processing to go through and make sense of, of, of the, the data that we've got. And we now in one click in a dashboard, we can show you if there's a finding, what the finding is, and we have a link that takes you directly to the context of the finding, meaning it drives you right into the single audit on the page with the wording in context of what you're looking at. So there's no ambiguity around what you're reading. And we did that because this is something that the users told us was very, very time consuming. A risk assessment right now is taking anywhere from four to eight hours. I, I have risk adjusted down to four hours just to say, let's be safe. And let's say people are really, really good and really, really efficient. 
and they can do these things in four hours. Um, it's actually over eight hours when you start to talk to people to really do an in-depth risk analysis. But the issue we have is that most of the time when you're looking at a grant recipient, it's pretty vanilla. There's usually not much there. Um, you know, most recipients are, are, are pretty good actors in the overall scheme of things. But there are the few and far between that are not the greatest uh, behaviors, we'll say. And what the grant recipient digital dossier does is by looking at four tabs, you can quickly ascertain whether there is something you need to look into a little more deeply or not. We've taken four hours worth of work down to 15 minutes. And I, I can't uh, tell you how impressed I was with my team to get to that level because I was never ever thinking that we would get down to 15 minutes, um, but we're there. And that's not saying that it's always done within 15 minutes. What I'm saying is you can get a good idea of what's going on with a potential, with an applicant, with a potential recipient, and it will give you indicators. Again, there's propensity for risk and Three of our tabs tell you propensity for risk. One tab tells you actual realized risk. And the only actual realized risk we've seen are the single audits right now. Now we would love to get into some financial disclosure statements and other things that we're working on moving down that path as we go forward. But going back to my 1975 comment about the 55 speed limit, and we're at 1973, we're very quickly moving to 1975. I mean, we're right up on the edge of it. And this is going to be a big change because all of a sudden we have this information at people's fingertips. Um, moving from four hours to 15 minutes, we are going to recognize a savings of, well, and I think it's on the next slide if I'm not mistaken, um, $142 million a year. Now that's pretty big in the grants arena, but what we're looking at is we're trying to take $142 million and that's a return to mission. That is not $142 million in savings or return on investment because we are investing through a grant within our society with it, you know, we want to, we want to build things up. If I could see five more grants issued in a year out of this $142 million, that's great. What I'd like to see is less of the com compliance factors needed. As Larry was saying earlier, um, when we start to look at the idea of moving forward and utilizing these emerging technologies, the audit should become much more streamlined and focused. Someone's not going to walk into the grant recipient digital dossier and want to audit um, the actual screens. They're going to want to audit our algorithms. How do we do our calculations? How do we obtain our information? And then once we know what that is, then the audit will be, well, where were these applied? And then that we can follow through in, from that, uh, that uh, methodology. What we're doing is we're, we're, we're reducing the risk factors around the potential recipients. We're standardizing the approach. We're making them comparable approaches. If you were looking at previously doing, um, if you had one applicant and four grant organizations were looking at that one applicant, you were burying 16 hours of time into risk assessments because we were doing it independently and subjectively. You can now do them concurrently, objectively and comparable in 15 minutes. And if you're sitting in one organization and you're looking at a, at a potential recipient and you know that there's another organization because you can see through the single audit that, that they've done some work for another organization, you could call them up and say, were there any indicators that you saw within that, within that application that, that caused you alarm or caused you concern? So you get that collaborative effect that you can start to build out too. Um, the, the, the really neat thing I really, really like about this is we are taking this approach and we're using something very similar to the credit score. So we are going to apply this within HHS and we have other folks who, who want to uh, use this already. Um, when I was saying earlier about the change management, um, the change management has been incredible here because folks are excited when they see what we're presenting and they actually want to get their hands on the tool. It's not us asking people whether they want the tool or not. It is, you know, when can we get the tool? More importantly, we can now take the tool and we can flip the tool because every recipient of a federal award who has a sub-recipient is required to do a pre-award risk assessment on the sub-recipients and they should be doing it the same way or similar way to the federal government. They don't right now, but with this tool, they can. They can also look at their own profiles. They can understand what their risky behaviors are and they can start to curb those behaviors. I said something about the credit score earlier. When, when I was younger, you got a credit score and you had no idea what the indicators were, the, you know, what factors were being assessed. They opened up the black box around the credit scores and very quickly people saw things like, it is actually a good thing to carry credit from one month to another month. Those people who are paying off their credit scores every single month were getting no credit score because they didn't have credit. They weren't carrying credit. 
they change behavior. And ultimately that's what we're looking for. If we can get the grant recipient to change behavior, to become more, more competitive within the arena, that is gonna be good for everybody. There may be some indicator that they're just really not aware of and they're not really focused on that's really drawing their score down. If they could change that one behavior and they could become a much more competitive uh, potential recipient, that's good for the entire ecosystem across the board. Um, so it's exciting work. Um, what my team has done has been absolutely incredible. Uh, I've shown this to many, many uh, folks across the federal government. We have a Department of Education who they're some of our biggest fans. We've already got a, a pilot going on with CNCS. But the bottom line here is the emerging tech that we're using nowadays can make life much simpler as long as you don't take the approach of I'm applying emerging technology to apply emerging technology. Look at the challenge, apply the right technology and think about the downstream effects of what you're doing. Because if we can make these, this much simpler for the compliance factors after the, after the fact, um, that's gonna be great for everybody. I've talked to a lot of auditors who say, wow, you're putting this whole thing on a blockchain. That's incredible um, because if I do a risk assessment today and a year from now, somebody wants to look at what I did today, they will be able to see it on the blockchain. We won't have to recreate it. We won't have to go back to a paper file. We won't have to pull information. We won't have to re, you know, redo things, rejigger everything uh, a year later when you really don't know what you did the year before. It will all be there. It will be transparent. And somebody will say, they can question. There was an indicator there. Why did you make the, the award? Well, if there was an indicator in there, in theory, I should have a mitigation within my notice of award for that indicator to say, hey, little concerned about your ability to do your performance reporting. You're not on time all the time. We want to see that, you know, met within this award. And if it's not, there's a condition around, it. we'll stop your, you know, your, your cash draws or something. Um, bottom line is it's, it's very interesting. Um, the work that Larry is doing over at HUD really enticed me. And we really, we're working on uh, getting sentiment analysis incorporated within the grant recipient digital dossier. Um, but we just have so many things to tackle first. That's what a, it's a little bit further down the line, but it's, it's absolutely incredible. And I'm really excited to see where this is going and, and how this is impacting risk. As I was saying in the beginning, we want to base things on empirical data. This is giving users empirical data at their fingertips. And that is our goal. Um, with that, I'd, I'd love to just stop now and turn it over to, uh, to Nancy. Thanks. I think we have to uh, advance a few slides to get to my presentation. Okay. Um, so I'm going to take a few steps back and um, talk about the need for data-driven decisions. Um, is that the slide we're on? It's a little hard for me to see. No, keep going. I think we're skipping Marianne's slides, right? Okay, yeah, here, right here. Let's start here. So the need for data-driven decisions. Um, I think I'll, I will cover that very quickly because we just really heard two very good examples of need for data-driven decisions. Next slide, please. Next slide. Oh, thanks. Um, so what, um, what I really want to talk about is some of the issues that I've heard talking to a lot of people across government um, who are trying to move into a more sophisticated environment and um, really kind of don't know, well, what are the steps that we take? How do we actually move from 1973, as Mike said, into the, into the present? And, um, you know, we know that there are lots of different sources of data. So you could be getting commercial data, statistical data, program data, logs, internet of things. Um, and you really have to think through sort of what, what is within your control? What do you have right now? And what don't you have that you would like to get access to? Next slide, please. And so what, um, what you, you need to know is sort of what is the inventory of data that are available to you, whether you own it or not. And if you don't own it, who is the owner and how would you go about getting access to that data? And then which data 
are missing from the data sets that might be within your agency that you might be getting from another agency, regardless of whether you're looking at um, you know, enterprise risk management or performance improvement. And then key to this is what, what are the things you have to do to safeguard the data? In other words, is it PPI? Is it confidential data? Is it open data? Um, how are you supposed to handle it? Next slide, please. So, um, you know, we've heard a little bit about there's a lot of tools out there. There's um, high performance computing environment, emerging technologies, but basically you want to sort of create a pipeline of data that's the appropriate data and then do some sort of data analytics on it. Next slide, please. One of the things that I think is often overlooked in this equation is um, thinking about um, the metadata, how the quality is managed in curation of the data, because there's an awful lot of data out there. And I think curation is really central in terms of winnowing out what you don't want, what's not of sufficient quality for you to use. Um, so next slide, please. So we've talked a little bit about evidence building and creating evidence and, and the um, Foundations for Evidence-Based Policy Act and OMB guidance that is out there re requires agencies to do learning agendas on um, what are the things that they wanna learn about their programs. And that could be in the area of managing risk it could be in the area of improving performance in certain programs, or it could be larger sort of societal outcomes. And then agencies have to put their evaluation plans together. And we have these new um, officials, the evaluation officers, the statistical officials that were created in the act. And um, then we have the guidance from OMB that um, really talks about best practices for doing this. Next slide, please. Uh, and then the Open Government Data Act, which was Title II of the Evidence Act, um, made the data open by default. It requires agencies to have a data inventory, to the creation of a federal data catalog. And importantly, it creates a chief data officer for agencies. Um, and then the Title III of the bill, um, next slide please, talks about the um, presumption of accessibility for statistical agencies and expanding secure access to data assets that are protected under the Confidential Information Protection and Statistical Efficiency Act. And I, I bring this up because a lot of times people are thinking about open data or just thinking about, well, this is the program data that I have, so that's what I'm going to use. But there's a very important new tool that um, you can consider if you wanna partner with a statistical agency. Um, there's a tremendous amount of data that can be linked together from multiple agencies to look at some bigger picture outcomes. So if you're looking at performance in a grant program, you might be looking at it from a compliance standpoint or, or the risk standpoint of, is something gonna go wrong with the way that the grantee's handling the money? But you also may be interested from a performance standpoint of what are these grants accomplishing out in the real world? And there's a lot of data out there um, that can answer that question. Um, there's a, a project called um, U metrics that was put together that was trying to establish what is the real world value of federal investment in research. And it looked at National Science Foundation grants that went to universities and was able to tie together information from the IRS, from the Patent and Trademark Office, from the Census Bureau um, in terms of like business, new businesses that were started up and also uh, demographic characteristics of the grantees, and then also using unemployment insurance records um, from states that we're able to look at were jobs created, 
what was the mobility for all the people that worked on the grants and in partnership with the universities was able to really look at what is the greater economic impact of these grants? Where was the money spent? How many businesses were formed? Um, did people have higher lifetime earnings as a result of being a graduate student on the grants? Uh, and how many patents resulted from the grants and, and what was the result of those patents? So. Um, that required a lot of agencies to get together in a secure environment to look at data to answer those questions. Um, but they're really important questions to answer. So depending on how you're looking at risk and performance, um, going beyond the traditional audit, there's really a lot of tools in the toolbox now that allow you to get access to data with the right partners. Next slide, please. So when we look at these new roles and responsibilities, we are really looking at kind of a data ecosystem. So we have the, the privacy person, we have the CIO, we have the chief data officer, evaluation officer, a statistical official, um, the performance improvement official, and then all the lines of business. So you really want to um, think about what is it you're trying to accomplish and how do all these people fit in in a way that can help you? Next slide, please. So when we're looking at data-driven decisions, um, you have to start with something and you really have to start with what is the question we're trying to answer? Um, and can we answer it with existing data regardless of, again, whether you're looking at these bigger outcomes or compliance or risk management? Next slide, please. So one of the one of the places to start with this is um, thinking about who do I need to get involved in this effort. Um, so there should be some kind of governance council in your agency. You'll have the data owners, uh, the data creators. Data creators could even be states or local governments that are sending or grantees who are sending information. Um, do you need to ingest data from a commercial source or some kind of external source, who owns these business processes and who are really the power brokers in terms of bringing the parties together to link data from multiple sources. And um, so you're really thinking strategically about who are your allies in this process and what are the barriers, who, who would be preventing you from doing this and coming up with a strategy for how you collaborate and how you can make these governance processes that have been set up work for you. And that really goes to thinking about what's in it for all of these parties. Why would a data owner wanna share their data with me? What are they going to get out of it? So you really have to start with, okay, I know what the possibilities are. I know what the law allows. I know that there's all these technologies out there, um, but, how do I really put a strategy together? Um, and you may not know exactly what data are out there. So next slide, please. Um, one of the things that should be going on in your agency or that you should be doing for yourself is identifying what are these key high value data sets in your agency um, that should be prioritized from an evidence building standpoint, either for risk management or performance improvement or um, some types of evaluation. And you wanna really work through this governance structure to bring people on board if you can, um, particularly if you need data from other sources. Um, but collaboration I know is very difficult um, in a lot of federal agencies that are siloed. So it, it really is kind of a, a strategic type of process and decision-making. Um, and if what you're doing is really high priority, you need to get the leadership of your agency engaged in understanding what are the really valuable pieces of information that you're going to get out of this. And, you know, if there's a cost benefit analysis, if there's, um, you know, a way that resources can be saved and reinvested as Mike was pointing out with some of the grants, ways that advance the mission. Um, all of this takes a lot of thinking through ahead of time. Next slide, please. 
And um, one of the key elements of this is really, um, do you have the people in your organization who have the right skills, who really understand data analytics and can, and can do this work? And it's very likely that, you know, given the federal hiring environment right now, you may not have those people. So it's important to be very open to bringing in outside partners, whether they're from a data analytics company, academia, um, there's lots of partners that you can bring in both internally and externally. So, um, you know, bef I I'm, before you just sort of jump in and say, I'm gonna grab this technology and do something really cool, you really do have to kind of go through this whole thought process and being sure what are the questions that you want to answer and then thinking through what what data do you need do you have it do you need to get it if you need to get it who are your partners for getting it once you have it can you bring in some really good advice whether it's from inside your agency or outside your agency um, to get these things in place it's so it's kind of a step-by-step -step think this through very carefully process before you just jump in and go out and buy some software or hardware. That's it. Okay, thank you, Nancy. Um, and thanks to all our panel members. Um, so we're going to look to get any questions from the audience. Um, in the meantime, while we're working to get those up, um, if there are any, or please ask them if you don't have any. Um, we'll go ahead and uh, have a few discussion questions for the panel. So the first one I have for you is, um, you know, we have now a lot of CXOs involved, right? We have CROs, chief risk officers, we have chief data officers, we have performance improvement officers. Um, and I think that maybe there's a little fatigue around that, um, but I, I think they all have important roles to play. So I would be interested to know from the panel, you know, how you think those roles should work together and what's the best um, way to approach that? Anyone who would like to start, feel free to jump in. Um, oh. Go ahead, Mike. Okay, sorry, Nance. Um, well, I think the most important thing is the recognition of the roles and making sure that they're all on equal playing fields. Um, I went to a CDO conference a couple of years ago and they were really struggling with the idea that the CDO was being placed under the CIO or the CTO. Um, that can be very concerning um, because a data officer has a very different outlook on things than a technology officer. Um, so that's first and foremost in my mind is, is put them all on an equal playing field and put guardrails up to make sure that we're not you know, overstepping. It's always good to give your two cents on, uh, on any idea or, or any initiative, um, but recognize that you know, everybody does have their specific role that they need to play and be respectful of those. I, I just think that's foundational to the whole basis. Yeah, I, I agree with Mike. Um, there needs to be a really clear definition. And I, I know because I worked on the OMB guidance that OMB did gave qualifications, but did not put together a, a structure recommended for agencies on reporting relationships and things like that, mainly because agencies didn't want it and said, we'll figure it out for ourselves. But I do think it's problematic, the structures that I've seen in some agencies being set up because there's there's overlap and a lack of clarity. And, you know, the chief data officers sometimes are too far down in the organization to actually do the job they need to do. Um, there, I, in my mind, I could, you know, be not hard for me to sit down and write the roles and responsibilities, but, not everyone would necessarily agree because um, one thing that we didn't talk about today was culture change and getting everybody to work collaboratively instead of trying to build empires and claiming turf, um, but really being collaborative around mission accomplishment is a big culture change in a lot of agencies. And that's what we really need before this is gonna work. Gary, I think you're on mute. There we go. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, this is all about culture change. That's right. And I agree with uh, Mike and Nancy about the role of the critical role of the CDO. I think that that should be an executive position. It should be in the secretary's office. It is about 
uh, leading this organizational transformation that we're talking about, because it's not going to be bricks and, and mortar in the future. It's going to be bits and bytes, and it's not going to be org charts. It's going to be uh, nested, integrated, recombinant work teams, and that, it's a different approach to running complex organizations and getting complex results. And also, I would wrap up by saying there's a critical role, conversational role that should be going on between the performance officers and the chief risk officer. If you don't know your CRO, you should go and seek him or her out and spend some time because <clears throat> where risk management is powerful is not about the realization of risks. So you can have a hallway conversation with most employees and they'll tell you where the problems are. It's about the mitigations and that is all about performance. And it's performance at the organizational level and it's performance at the individual level. And the performance officers have an extraordinarily important role in making risk management real um, and so my, uh, my parting advice is uh, get out there and get to know your chief risk officer. They like coffee or sometimes things stronger and uh, you'll find that they're agreeable and they've got a big vision like you do and you ought to uh, spend some time with them. Wonderful. Okay, well, thank you to our panel members. It looks like we are out of time, but I think this is a really interesting discussion. And um, on the slide deck, if you all have a copy of it later, there is um, some contact information if you have further questions.